This is Smart Women, Smart Power, a podcast that features conversations with some of the world's most powerful women. We did have a good male ally in the intelligence community who gave us kind of the a good case, you know, mm-hmm. that we could make to our colleagues who were essentially saying that Montenegro was too corrupt, that they hadn't done enough on democracy. We feature thought leaders at all career levels, where we explore, among other things, the many contributions that women make to the fields of international business, national security, foreign policy, and international development. Does having women in positions of power influence the outcomes of decisions in these fields? Why or why not? Join me, Dr. Kathleen McInnes, director of the Smart Women Smart Power Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies for these incredible conversations. So today I am absolutely thrilled to have uh, Dr. Evelyn Farkas seated next to me here uh, in the podcast studio today. Um, Dr. Farkas is currently the executive director of the McCain Institute at Arizona State University. And prior to this role, she held the role of Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia. You know, just a small, small portfolio. Um, she's worked with NATO. She ran for the House of Representatives and so much more. She's just an all around badass in our community. So I'm just so thrilled to have you here and to learn from your experience. Oh, thank you, Kathleen. It's really an honor to be invited to be on the podcast. I've been watching from afar, you know, hoping I get invited. So thank you. <laughs> it's so great to hear here. So, um, OK, like you, you are such a dominant force within our field and in, in so many positive ways. And so. But what got you into this field? Like, why? what drew you to the weird old world of national security? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's really personal because my parents are Hungarian refugees. They fled communist Hungary in 1956 after the revolution to overthrow communism failed. They came to the United States for political freedom, for economic opportunity. Um, I grew up with my parents, my grandparents, very much behind the Iron Curtain. So I would go and visit as a kid and I knew what the alternative to democracy was, what it felt like, what it meant when your parents said to you, Shh, the neighboring lady is a spy. And if you say the wrong thing, your grandparents will get in trouble. And understanding trouble wasn't like something minor, like in the States, trouble could mean prison, you know. So I really appreciated everything about America. And I really wanted to make America and the world a better place. And I think The last thing I'll add to that is that my parents made me understand what was so rotten in people by educating me about European history and especially the history of World War II, the Holocaust, and then also, you know, the Soviet Stalinist era as well. So I was really motivated to try to see what I could do to, again, make the world better, use America's power to make peace more possible. (laughs) You know, well, and also, you know, I feel like that tangible sense, that that visceral understanding of what a authoritarian world actually is. Right? It's missing. Like we just sort of think it's like capitalism light or 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 capitalism hard. Some something, some permutation of this world that we live in right now. Yeah. No. Yeah. It people is, think it's a little less freedom. Yes. But it's actually no freedom. Right. <laughs> like and, and how like it it's it's mind boggling in its implications, but we we're losing our our tactile sense of that. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah. that's one of the things that's affecting the, the the discourse right now about authoritarianism. Yeah, I think that people need to read history. They need to watch movies. I mean, I think that the you know the arts have a big role to play in kind of keeping these things alive for us. We need to hear from the human rights defenders all over the world, as you. I think you mentioned I'm running the McCain Institute now, and we are inspired by the legacy of John McCain, who stood up for individuals who wanted freedom, you know, all over the world, whether they were living in an aspiring democracy or in a hardcore autocracy, you know, in a dictatorship, because, you know, those people understand what's at stake and they'll fight and they'll live and die for what Mm -hmm. they what they would like, which is freedom. Right. I mean, because the alternative when I was in Ukraine in August, uh, yeah, w- one woman put it to me. You know, there there are fates worse than death. Yeah, yeah, which is you know hard to believe, but it's a kind of torture if you're watching, for example, your child put in jail mm-hmm. or tortured for literally physically for um, saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing for being unable to achieve your aspirations. Right? I mean, that can 
certainly launch you into at a minimum a depression, but it's a kind of it's a kind of torture. Yeah. Yeah. So and, and we're we're in such a profound moment. Democracy is really under threat. And our the authoritarian adversaries are really doubling down. They're cracking down on, on women, on LGBTQ communities. We've got we're concentration camps right. in China. Right. Right. So I'm mean, just wondering your thoughts on that. And from the position that you're in at the McCain Institute, how do you think we can combat that? Well, first of all, we have to draw more attention to it. And I really, I give David Melibrand a lot of credit because mm-hmm. he coined this term, the age of, age of impunity, and tried to draw attention to the fact that the world, not only are we not paying enough attention to what the autocrats are doing, but we're not pushing back. There's no justice. And or justice is too slow. I mean, I'm hopeful that there will be justice. For example, the fact that the Ukrainians have been able to take so much evidence to the international courts, that there's so much now public opinion and and major states that are rallied behind them. That will open the door for Syrians also, for example, perhaps the, you know, the Rohingya people, you know, other people who have been wronged to finally get redress. So I think one, one, persistent problem is the lack of attention, the lack of remedy, or again, justice being served. And that's really a a lack of political will. The international institutions have failed us in large part, frankly, because it's the states that aren't using them effectively. Mm -hmm. I think the United States could use our power more effectively. We could use at least our bully pulpit. You know, people often say, well, what's the difference if you're just talking about it? But I mean, John McCain, there was not that much he could do, you know, as a senator to change the fate of individual people. But he would talk about it and yep. put pressure that way. You know, that is a kind of pressure. You know, we at the McCain Institute, we are heavily involved in talking about Vladimir Karamurza, who's one of the political dissidents, um, along with Alexei Navalny, who have been wrongfully imprisoned by Vladimir Putin. Talking about them helps keep them alive because yep. it puts pressure on the government to not just indiscriminately murder them, although they're mm-hmm. slowly trying to do so. Right. I was talking about this earlier with a friend. The, the, the power of articulation. You're, you're, you're exactly right. We say you're, it's just words. But when you express things, when you talk about things, it makes things real for us. And, you know, and it does it solve everything? No. But it does ensure that we don't forget and, we, and that there is a way to start catalyzing action. So, so speaking those words and those memories and bringing things forward and calling attention is critically important. Yeah. And if you talk to the opposition, for example, um, Russian opposition, you know, who want democracy in Russia, they'll say, we don't mind if you can't make change, but we don't want you to forget us. Yes. It, it's incredibly heartening for us to hear you talking about us and talking yes. about our quest. So we tend to downplay it, especially in the U.S. where we're so practically oriented. Mm-hmm. Like, well, if it doesn't change anything real what's the what's the point but it gives people hope they can keep fighting right right and it's so important to turn to the decision and you know so it's related to this i think um that we're good to talk about today is your office's decision or and 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 role in bringing montenegro into the nato alliance which is huge, right? I mean, thinking about it back in the day when we, we did like NATO expansion in the 90s, like Mont- like Montenegro would not have been one of the things we like would have been reflexively like, yeah, um, even though you're saying you're Poland free. So I would love to, if, if it could like walk us through what was happening at the time. Like, what did you see in Montenegro that that, that sort of pushed you towards the, the view that... Montenegro does need to be a NATO member now. So this is, you know, when people ask me about decisions, I try to think of like the decision that made the biggest impact on the world. So that's why this one came to mind. Yeah. Because Montenegro became a NATO member because of my office basically insisting and persisting and getting it on the agenda for the NSC and ultimately at the the president's desk. I have to give credit to the now president, then Vice President Biden, for actually convincing President Obama to say yes. And once he said yes, then it was a foregone conclusion because of the U.S. power within the NATO alliance. Mm -hmm. But what happened was I started working um, at the Pentagon as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, which included the Balkan non-NATO countries and 
and actually also Albania and Croatia, which are NATO allies, mm-hmm. and were at the time. And I, I got briefings from all of my colleagues. And this was August of 2012. And when they came in and they explained the process, you know, what Montenegro was doing in order to become a NATO member, I thought, you know, we can work with this. There's a lot they've done already. And I think that we can build a case here. Yeah. And part of my rationale was, first of all, they were trying very hard. They were a small country. We had not done anything on NATO enlargement or expansion for several years and not under President Obama. Right. Now, I knew that he wasn't This wasn't a priority for him. And in fact, possibly he was not interested. But what I knew was that for the Europeans, for the aspirants and for the the region, especially as Russia was increasing pressure, but they they had not yet invaded Ukraine. But remember, they had occupied Republic of Georgia, 20% of it in 2008. Putin was exercising economic pressure, political pressure all over Europe, Mm -hmm. especially in Eastern Europe. And NATO was not pushing back significantly enough, in my mind, (laughs) um, against Putin. So I felt that it was important to try to see what we could do with Montenegro because the real rationale for expanding NATO was not an anti-Russian rationale. So if you look back to when the war fell and we did the first round of expansion with Czech, at the time, Czechoslovakia, Mm -hmm. Poland and Hungary, it was to enhance stability. It was yeah. to basically say these countries are democracies. They've dealt with all the tensions inside their borders and and they have peaceful relations with their neighbors. So the borders are not in question. And therefore, international business community, you can invest in these countries and yeah. help them become flourishing, not only democracies, but capitalist countries. So the rationale was actually not anti-Russian. Don't let people tell you otherwise. Yeah, That is yeah. not to say that it wasn't a component and certainly it was of much more significant value for the countries that were afraid of Russia. So the the countries getting into NATO, for them, it was more important than it was for the Western European and North American allies. Um, Over time, of course, it became more important to get into NATO to have a guarantee against Russia. Yes. Because of Putin's increasing aggressive foreign policy. So anyway, just to fast forward there, um, we started to make a case, but what we found was opposition. We found opposition at the State Department all the way up to the highest levels. I remember being in a dinner that the Secretary of Defense at the time, Secretary Hagel, hosted, and Secretary Kerry was opposed. And, um, you know, I think we were dining with the Montenegrin, so he was just <laughs> fl- <laughs> lightly awkward. opposed. Um, ultimately, what what was really interesting about that experience, and here's where the gender part comes in, mm-hmm. was that the woman who came to me, my colleague who came to me and staffed me, you know, explained to me and was my 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 staff expert, she was a woman. The people that we worked with, very most closely with, was our ambassador in Montenegro at the time, Sue K. Brown. We had the Minister of Defense of Montenegro, who was my top ally on this, uh, on the Montenegrin side, woman. <laughs> How interesting. And it was interesting that we had a scrappy team of very determined women. And when I when I left the Pentagon and I reflected on this, I told my colleagues that what I learned in that experience in particular was that what mattered was not your your brain, which is when I, I, you know, I came to D.C. in 97 and I was an academic in the military world teaching Marines. And I thought, oh, I'm going to make a difference because I know things and I can think and be smart. And what I learned was, no, there are tons of smart people. But if you put your heart into something and we women, my colleague, Melissa and I and the, you know, then ambassador and the minister of defense, we put our hearts into getting Montenegro. We had our brains were obviously fully functional and you know, on the <laughs> yeah, job. Totally. totally. But w- but it required our heart to persist and yeah. continue. And we built a case. We u- we did have a good male ally in the intelligence community who gave us kind of the a good case, you know, mm-hmm. that we could make to our colleagues who were essentially saying that Montenegro was too corrupt, that they hadn't done enough on democracy. Mm-hmm. And our argument was, well, they're not going to have zero corruption. Yep. Let's look at how they look relative to where they started yep. and frankly, relative to other countries that we allowed into NATO, you know, who had corruption and continue to have corruption. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, w- we faced opposition um, in my organization. It was more indifference. And then Putin invaded and took Crimea. Yeah. And so from that moment on, we had now an advantage. Putin helped us. Yeah. Because the indifference in my chain of command turned to, well, we might as well, because we're not going to give Russia NATO, uh, yeah. veto rather. And so 
let's try it. Yeah. And so it went up the chain yeah. to the White House from DOD mm -hmm. and state opposition softened because of the work that we had done. And ultimately, um, Montenegro became a member of NATO, which I think, again, it, it just showed ongoing progress in spreading stability, democracy, and, and, and yes, countering Putin. Mm -hmm. With so much foresight, right? Montenegro is an anchor because, you know, Russia is now really trying to destabilize, but it's trying to, to bring the Balkans back into its own sphere of influence, right? And so having Montenegro as an anchor in that. And also one of the things that you said that resonated it with me is this NATO expansion was not about Putin or Russia, right? Like it's, 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 it's a, it was about internal stability. It was about, in, it, it was, it was an act amongst allies. And, and, and so it just highlights the fear and the paranoia that was happening on the Russian side to interpret this as. Yeah. Although, to be fair, again, for the Eastern Europeans who were close, you know, in close proximity to the Russian Federation, they didn't trust okay. that Russia yeah. no, that's true. Would, yeah. wouldn't again try to invade them or exercise undue influence over them. And so they did want, you know, a guarantee. They did want that security guarantee. But from our perspective, yeah. you know, and the Western European perspective, it wasn't about Russia. Right, right. And another thing that you said, there's so much that you said that resonated, and putting your heart into it, right? I, yeah. said, I remember being told by a male colleague back in the day, like, he sat me down and said, you're too passionate about the issues. Oh, I hate when people say that. Right, you're too <laughs> passionate about the issues, you, um, and when your, your, your emotion is making you not credible, right? So, yeah. and that was, and it was just like, Actually, no, 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 no. This My colleagues were told that about Ukraine, but and Russia, like fighting for more, more policy against Russia at the time. It's crazy, you know, because that's actually what makes you effective. It can make you a superhero within these bureaucratic institutions at anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, so, it, it, again, that just resonated very strongly. That, that it was your heart that made that initiative successful. Yeah, and it is funny because I. That it's often used against women. But now that I'm like thinking about John McCain every day, you know, I realize that actually he had that same passion. But I don't think anyone told him not to be so emotional. <laughs> <laughs> you right? there, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So to wrap up our conversation, do you think that I mean, you sort of touched on it, but do you think that your gender as a woman had an impact on the decisions that, and, and the, the decision for the United States to accept or to, to advocate for Montenegro to be part of the alliance. Do you think your gender had an impact? And if so, why? And if not, why not? I mean, probably in a micro sense, because we worked so collaboratively, all of us women together, and we weren't worried about who was going to get credit. And, you know, ultimately, none of us got credit, and that's totally fine. Well, probably the Minister of Defense of Montenegro got yeah. credit. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and that's totally fine. But I don't know whether Ambassador Brown got a lot of credit. Um and by the time it happened, I think she had left the post um, and it was a new ambassador. So, you know, who also should get credit. But so I think it was mostly how we worked together. Again, it was about the objective and not about who was getting the recognition. If we had been male, I'm, I'm not sure whether we would have hung together as much, but that's more on the micro level. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us today. For Fascinating me. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Subscribe to the Smart Women, Smart Power podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to great content. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Smart Women, or you can follow me on Twitter at KJ McInnes One. Thanks for listening and join us next time.